From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel. They call me Ben. We're joined, as always, with our super producer, Paul Mission Control Deccant. Most importantly, you are you, you are here, and that makes this the stuff they don't want you to know. Recently, a bit of backstage stuff. Uh, guys, we had a conversation about a particularly troubling story around organ transplants, which we'll get to in a moment, fellow conspiracy realist. Uh, this inspired us to return to a continuing series of explorations and conspiracies that began in the ancient past and appear to escalate in the modern day. This is our 2023 update. Who wants to live forever? Here are the facts. You and I are going to live forever. Maybe. Maybe. Should we want to? I'm clear. <laughs> I don't <laughs> really want to know how the garden grows. I'm kidding. I I, I am obsessed with people growing plants. I oh, want yeah. to know all about it. I Send me your how plant they, pictures. How they don't kill them because uh, that is, I have a black thumb, as it were. But yeah, we've we've definitely talked about this subject. Uh, currently, there are three to four different kinds of. I guess, quote unquote, it seems like a bit of a hyperbolic term, but immortality. Mm -hmm. um, and they are not all created equal. In fact, a lot of them are kind of a monkey's paw type scenario. They're not particularly great. No, we're going to do a, we'll do it. Let's do a cr quick recap, right? And uh, at the end of each, we will uh, give you the human version of it. But you're right, Noel. Uh, these different genres of practicable, immortality they're not super great they're sort of like you know a geo metro is a car but is it your favorite car uh, no no but let's let's talk about the jellyfish that we mentioned back in the day because this i remember this blowing my mind when we learned this that there's a type of jellyfish that can upon going through some kind of traumatic event basically morph itself or back into uh, the like early stages of life and then restart. Is that real? The humble Turritopsis Dorney. <laughs> yeah. It's a, it, the adult version of this would be about as wide as an adult human pinky nail. All right. So Shaquille O'Neal, this thing is not, uh, it was first discovered in 1883 or, you know, we need hard air quotes around discovered. Some European scientists found it in the Mediterranean and then they ignored it. Humans ignored this guy for uh, around about a century, give or take, until in the 1990s, they noticed something bizarre. Yeah, I'm picturing this scenario. Um, I guess it reminds me of the way maybe like uh, seahorses give birth. Um, these fellas produced uh, usually, typically the old-fashioned way in terms of the way old-fashioned jellyfish reproduce using free-floating sperm and eggs that meet not inside the body but in the ocean, you know, more like tadpole, you know, kind of uh, scenario. Uh, and they tend to also die in regular ways, like, you know, they're yummy little delicacies uh, to sea predators, um, environmental hazards of course you know it's hard out there for a jellyfish I'm not gonna lie mm -hmm. yeah they're not apex predators no but matt as you were saying the humble turritopsis does have a superpower so if it goes through a hard time that doesn't fully kill the organism it has this crazy ability to transform its cells like Put, him, put, put its own cells in a time machine, go back into its earlier stages, drop back down in the ocean, become what like polyps again, right? And then bud back into these jellyfish that then rise up and get to be jellyfish again. So what, what doesn't kill them literally makes them younger and <laughs> strong, stronger. What doesn't That's, kill you makes yeah, you younger. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's so. like they get, it's like imagine you're playing a video game and you get the game over sign or, uh, you know, the screen. And then you say, okay, well, I'll just start again. In human terms, this is like if you were in a massive car crash, catastrophic, you know, 
all of a sudden, instead of dying, you would turn into a fetus. So the first responders would, you know, use the jaws of life and open up the car and there would be just a little baby you. Aww, baby driver. That's what everyone baby would driver. say. <laughs> yes, just Aww, so. Look yeah. at that little fella. We don't know enough about this uh, Turtopsis to, we, we as a civilization don't know enough about jellyfish in general to guess at whether these things carry over any previous knowledge or experiences on their great reset. And we also don't know how often they can trigger this reboot. You know, is it like the old superstition about cats? Do they get nine lives? And then it's just your final jellyfish or can they do a rinse and repeat process? If that's the case under the right circumstances, these things can just continue ad infinitum. At the very least, though, you'd think I'd be interested at least in maybe a topic for a different day. You, you would wonder if there was research being done into how this occurs and if it can be harnessed in some way, you know? Mm -hmm. Yes. How can we apply that uh, how like technology is the measured application of natural processes, right? So how can we better emulate the jellyfish? This particular jellyfish, it's the only one. Just so you know, folks, next time you see a jellyfish, that thing's going to die. You know, it's not as cool. We're, we're talking about winning the lottery. And back in 2008, these tiny little pinky nail sized turritopsies, they swarmed the world's oceans. And a couple of scientists looked into this and they found that no matter where they picked up a specimen of this jellyfish, it would bear an identical genetic code. It's not just an immortal jellyfish, it's a clone army. So uh, replicating that is wild. That that should be fodder for a great story. I'm right on board. There. I want to yeah. eat one. You know what I mean? Jellyfish oh, are like that's the where first your mind gummy. immediately goes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, let's just see what they. You know what do they taste like? All right, all right, Darwin. <laughs> <laughs> all right, but the jellyfish isn't the only creature we've looked at that has some kind of crazy regenerative slash immortal superpower, right? Right. Let's do uh, made for TV. Let's sell our life extension technology, right? So, okay, if it sounds inconvenient for you to turn into a baby instead of dying, uh, why not just get a Wolverine superpower? Why not study the uh, works of the amazing and, in my opinion, disgusting Planarian? Yeah, in 2011, some smart folks over at MIT dug super deep into uh, this particular superpower. Uh, Daniel Wagner and Irving Wang killed planarians in a, a number of ways. Which are worms. They're flatworms. Yeah, 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 they're flatworms. Wasn't that the thing that was in that lady's brain? Uh, that was a nematode, but that wasn't far off. I think that was a round worm. Yeah, well, they're, okay, sorry, round hole. There are pen. a lot of worms is the main thing. It's true. And if you're really creeped out by worms, don't watch the new Goosebumps reboot on Disney+. Plus. Um, so Daniel Wagner and Irving Wang uh, basically did a, you know, planarian genocide. Um, and it became particularly interesting to them uh, to study radiation uh, as a means of execution. Because high doses of radiation kill the animal's ability to regenerate, which makes sense. Um, but then they conducted a transplant, putting one cell from a donor worm at the tail of the irradiated terminal worm. So the, the worm that was on its way out. Uh, National Geographic uh, has a, a very telling description of the results. Yeah, here it goes. Uh, quote, as the planarian dies from the head backwards, the transplanted cells spread from the tail upwards. At its worst, the animal is a stunted mass with no discernible head. But two weeks after the transplant, it has completely regenerated. A new planarian has risen, phoenix-like, from the ashes. Its entire body is now genetically identical to the single transplanted cell. Hey, beautiful, beautiful. Uh, also, okay, terrified. Amazing. X-Files. In the human example, in the anthropocentric example, let's go back to that idea of the car crash. It sucked. 
You shouldn't have driven that Geo Metro. You have lost both your legs, maybe half your body. Uh, it's a coin toss at that point, if you have the Planarian superpower, over which part of you regenerates. For a reason scientists don't fully understand. This gets weirder. The Planarian, upon regeneration, upon donation of cells, upon dividing, it carries the memories of its previous existence. So by that logic, if humans could emulate this, you would regenerate after a car crash, but two of you would regenerate. And each instance of you would have some vague recollection of the days or decades before that car crash. It reminds me of one of the 13 days of Halloween stories in this season. Plug! <laughs> Plug! <laughs> a little transplantation that occurs. Oh, uh, we're so we're so gassed right now, fellow conspiracy realist of 13 days of Halloween. Big props to Matt Frederick, big props to Aaron Manke and Alex Williams. Uh, also, Noel, I'm hearing some pretty, pretty cool stuff about an episode you're working on. I'm doing some bleeps and bloops for a very uh, cool episode written by our buddy Joe McCormick, who's also been on the show talking about, oh gosh. Uh, the bicameral mind. The bicameral mind, exactly. Another instance of two things existing as one. 100%. Yeah, so so that's, um, that's still inconvenient, right? That's not quite immortality. That's more franchising, really. Uh, so. It is crazy, though, that you could take cells from another individual creature, one cell, attach it to a thing that is dead and or, you know, dying and about to be dead. And then it can become that dead thing. Like that's, and the dead, as you said, the dead thing retains stuff. That I don't know, man. That's, that's too much for me. Well, Matt, it is also October. We hurtle headlong toward the most wonderful time of the year. Uh, so <laughs> what better time to talk about these creepy things? We also want to uh, point out the third version of immortality, which does exist. It's quite cruel. Uh, it's the story of Henrietta Lacks, particularly her cancer cells. Uh, she was, she is technically the first human immortal she was a U.S. resident, African-American, died at 31 with a evil, aggressive form of cervical cancer. She passed away. She is dead and has been dead for a long time. After her death, without her knowledge nor her consent, doctors at John Hopkins took samples of the cancer that ended her life. And they used them to form an immortal human cancer cell line, which continues today. It's now known as HeLa. It's been used for countless medical innovations and discoveries, just like the guy who invented the three-point seatbelt, Niels mm. Bolin, no relation. Right. It's sort of difficult to, it's difficult to understand how many lives this immortal saved. Uh, but the well, HeLa, yeah. It, well, in this year, uh, the family, the descendants, of of that line of Henrietta Lacks, they finally settled with Thermo Fisher for a, a pretty hefty sum, uh, which is at least some kind of justice in that, I don't know, tale. Yeah, because they, they worked tirelessly for decades in a real David versus Goliath story to get recognition for, you know, what some people spiritually would view as an atrocity and one that continues. The Henrietta Lacks, the HeLa cells, they have no memory of their origin or their previous life. You can't quite, you know, you can't wire them up to a computer and have a chat, right? And that's where we get to the fourth version of immortality, which is like immortality, asterisk, the newest kid on the block, living forever as a digital emulation. This is on the way. The first versions are not going to be good. They're going to leverage large language models, you know, and some early form of generalized AI, and they're going to pull all the data they can about a person while they were alive. All your text, 
even the ones you wish you didn't send, all your recorded conversations, social media posts, biographical info, uh, Gary Oldman meme. Everything. Right? <laughs> what is that from? <sighs> I can't remember. I think he's saying every one, though, right? Okay. I guess, I guess mm-hmm. what I think of a fun Gary Oldman voice is, I have crossed oceans of time <laughs> to find you. The creatures of the night. What sweet music they make. Uh, <laughs> see, so this idea is you could get, if you get enough information from a person, if you get enough uh, instances of their living reaction to external stimuli then you can the idea is you can emulate this person you can model what they would have said or what they would have done in reaction to new stimuli this is a uh, deep water it poses a wide range of questions and problems and we'll examine those later this evening what you need to know there's a lot happening in this field and it's going to take a long time for the living meathead world to catch up. Yeah, just the concept of all your recorded conversations, when you think about what the government might be recording at all times when you use your phone, um, that's a little creepy, because if they wanted to, maybe they could have all the data with all your recorded convos. I mean, it's a natural extension of deepfake, right? That's what's happening. It's the future is now. And believe right, it, it's like not. organic deep fake. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. boy. Okay. Dun, 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 And believe it or not, most of this, these three to four, honestly, as you said, Noel, kind of stinky versions of immortality, they're old beans. Scientists are researching the implications of these various genres of avoiding death and billionaires and multimillionaires are pouring their fortune into the one thing they can yet not buy a life that never ends. I mean, you get it. Classic human. You have to look far. It's a fool's errand for most of history. It's also like the the MacGuffin of so many like villain arcs in, you know, adventure, historical fiction, science fiction. You know, there's always some evil gazillionaire that like he has it all or they have it all except for the secret of eternal life. And that usually drives them mad because it is usually presented as being unattainable and or monkey's paw level. Like you don't even know what to do with it once you get it. It's yours, Indy. Yours and mine. (laughs) But then they cross the seal, right? And uh, in Indiana Jones, well, spoilers, the Holy Grail doesn't work out for them. Uh, And, you know, you... Makes for some great practical effects, though. (laughs) It is great, right? Yeah. The penitent man kneels before God. Uh, So in in the past, obviously, a lot of people tried and failed to stave off death. And you could look at the pursuit of immortality as this sort of vanity project, right? Uh, Look at the pyramids, look at the Taj Mahal, the Arc de Triomphe, and so on. But now, the reason we're doing this update this evening, turns out that research may be paying off, and further, forces may conspire to keep that knowledge from the masses. We'll see whether or not they can do it. But as you are listening, This evening, as strange as it sounds, the first immortal may be alive today. And we're going to track that joker down right after these messages. No, I'm just joking. We'll be right back, though. Here's where it gets crazy. That's correct, fellow conspiracy realist. The first immortal human being may have already been born, or at least... Someone who breaks the conventional scientific understanding. Right now, science says all things being equal, if you have all the money and you have all the genetic factors at your back, you can live to 125 to 150, at which point your uh, your basic code will break down. But an actual immortal may be alive now. Uh, and when we say actual immortal, we're not talking about these, the three to four crappy conditions 
we explored earlier, we're talking about immortality that is Holy Grail level. See, our references mm-hmm. pay off. Oh, yeah. That, that satisfies the following three conditions. Has a claymore. Uh, isn't afraid to decapitate other immortals. Right. right? Uses magic. Mm-hmm. 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 <laughs> Skilled Gets the in quickening. magic. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Arch nemesis is called the Cro- the Krogan. The Kragan. What was that guy's name? That guy's awesome. What a great villain in Highlander, the first mm-hmm. one. Yeah. They never worked together. And the franchise took a weird turn when they went to space. But, you know. There is no judgment in brainstorming. The uh, the the idea of being immortal in like the the paragon, the platonic ideal of it, is that you will have regenerative ability, meaning that your cells will continue to divide and reproduce while also not encountering the inevitable physical genetic degradation of age. Yeah, you won't hit that. Exactly. You won't hit that hay flick limit, right? Where Mm -hmm. after 40 to 60 replications, your cells are like, no, we're still going, man. Well, if if, if we're doing plugs, um, this Rolling Stones podcast that is about to wrap that I've been working on, uh, we talk a lot about Keith Richards' insane drug abuse and, you know, just absolutely the fact that he has cheated death so many times. And there's a scene where they like hired a doctor for this tour. And one of our interview guys is talking to the doctor while they're on their private plane. And like Keith Richards is like hanging from the luggage bins. And the doctor leans into this guy, Gary Stromberg, and says, you see? They're like simians. That's why they. That's why they. They're invincible. <laughs> they're like simians, because you know. I mean, Keith Richards probably got his act together to a certain degree, but that guy's got to be pushing eight, late eighties, you know, and he's n- not showing any signs of slowing down, and you know, smoked more than is humanly possible, did all the crazy drugs you can imagine, and uh, I, he still seems pretty spry. So sometimes you do have to wonder, like, there is a genetic lottery, and it does seem like we don't fully know what it is. Someone should study Keith Richards' genetic markers. That'd be an interesting uh, um, bit of data. I do not know something like that is happening. Okay. Ozzy Osbourne sort of paved the way as well, because yeah. the, the question for any physician would be, how could this person, given a history of abuse, survive, even with all the, the financial... Uh, well, yeah, access to yeah, checkups the, and... Yes, financial agency. The, that, that's the question. So the first one is regenerative ability. The second issue is the problem of replacement. It's the old ship of thesis argument, right? Which has now acquired a new terrifying relevancy. What's the ship of thesis for those of us playing along at home? Comes up a lot for us, you know, it's just the idea of, I think it's come up in multiple conversations about AI and about technology even, like the idea of if something has every single component replaced, uh, is it still the original thing? And, you know, with technology, that's maybe less relevant. But when it comes to a person where we ascribe some meaning to, like, the the, the chaos of what our parts, you know, the, we are greater than the sum of our parts. If every single part of a person is replaced, is it still the same person? It is a, a fabulous uh, linchpin for sci-fi type conversations. Yeah, it's a big deal because you could replace every component in a phone, right? And it's still that version of that phone. But well, it was mass it, manufactured in the first place. You exactly. Know what I mean? It doesn't work for individual biological things, at least as far as we know right now. Hardware software argument, right? And so, you know, you get a new computer, you put, uh, you put your Google shenanigans on mm-hmm. there right now now it's the same brain different body huh what gives uh that's the third problem the third problem for real immortality cognitive durability there is no use long term in making a body or hardware that is constant if the mind can't keep up the pace because then you end up with something where it's like oh wow this car has great maintenance. The guy who was supposed to drive it hasn't been back in, you know, centuries. Still responds on the uh, chat input, though. 
Nice. Hey, nice. <laughs> and this is this is all to say we definitely need robotic bodies. Like we need to become androids ASAP, guys. Let's go. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. As soon as androidically androidically possible. Yes. I mean, I, I just started playing Cyberpunk now that it's sort of like a, a whole game. And it does it is good, by the way, if anyone has been like hesitant because of all the bad press, but it does a really good job of showing you, you know, what what would it what would a world be like where you could like supercharge any part of your body or your brain or your like optics. And it also shows how that creates a haves and have nots kind of scenario. Because what? some people no way. some people can afford it, some people have to get it black market, and sometimes that black market stuff does not work as advertised and it can kill you or turn you into like a psycho berserker or something, you know? Thank you for your interest in Heart by Disney. If you would like to continue your circulation, please subscribe to Heart by Disney Plus premium signature collection plan. And the rate has gone up this month. We're, uh, we're upping the we're upping the subscription. You can server. get yeah. 30 more BPM if you sign mm-hmm. up for our extreme mm-hmm. package. Call right. that a boost. That's a boost. <laughs> yeah. It's like a boost card. Yeah. You know, it's all in-app purchases, you know, <laughs> what a physiology. Time. What it's a wild, time. guys. Yeah, everybody. We're joking can. around, but we're yeah. not that far off from this kind of stuff. I mean, we're, yeah. you know, g- given the opportunity and the availability, you know, folks are going to want to, I mean, the people in power are going to want to do stuff like this. Guys, everybody write into our advertisers and tell them we've got a pitch. Uh, this would have been a great time for an Illumination Global Unlimited ad, but as as we know, they take the month of October off for uh, conferences. So in, in recent years, <laughs> you don't have to look far to see examples of people working separately and together to solve these three big questions. Physical durability, replacement question, and then cognitive durability. If you tuned into our weekly strange news segment, you may recall, fellow conspiracy realist, our brief discussion about a guy I love. His name's Brian Johnson. He was big in Venmo. He's in his mid 40s, 45, 46 now. He's not a billionaire. He's a man of the people, okay? He's just a multimillionaire. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay, and okay. he went viral. Uh, in Western news uh, because of a particular aspect of his ongoing quest to first slow and then mitigate and then reverse his biological clock. Apparently he has the gum inflammation level of a 17 year old that stood out to me. I'm like, I need to floss more. (laughs) Piers Morgan said he had the gum, whatever of an 18 year old, then a 17 year old. And I got so confused because like, Piers how Morgan, yeah, notable expert, it. Piers Morgan, <laughs> well, no, the, the, notable the, the, expert on gum right. inflammation. Yeah. Yeah. But he does have a charming accent. And, and the interview you're referencing, Matt, that, that we all watched, um, I thought it was a little dirty pool because he interviews this guy, you know, for a, a while and is very, wow, this is awesome. Tell me more. And then the guy leaves and he immediately has on this really mean, older British scientist who just absolutely lambasts the guy. He said, well, he may have the gum inflammation of a 17 year old, but he also appears to have the intellect of a 17 year old, like really nasty stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, it, it begs the question though, is like a, this guy's not trying to sell you this, but he also sort of is because he's he's creating a regimen that he's like testing on himself. It's called Blueprint, I think. Mm-hmm. And that ultimately would be a thing that you could you know, pay for, I guess, in terms of like the secret sauce or whatever. But at the end of the day, he seems to truly believe in this and he seems to be very happy doing it. But it involves taking like hundreds of supplements every day, mm-hmm. going to bed at eight o'clock. You mm-hmm. know, he, he eats a very specific, strict vegan diet. Caloric so, reduction. Caloric yeah. reduction, which is, is a thing. We know a lot it's of these true. things yeah, mixed true. into his his, his regimen are, are good things. But like, you know, the, the mean British scientist was like, the amount of supplements this guy's taking, 90% of that stuff is, is bunk. You mm-hmm. don't need that. If you just eat a good diet, you're going to get most of these, you know, these nutrients. Like I was prescribed a vitamin D supplement because I guess I don't go outside enough. <laughs> I got a I got an alarming message from my doctor say you are drastically low in vitamin D. So I take that like twice a week, but that's it. Everything else if you're eating right, you're you're probably okay. Yeah, this this is the issue. Here's why this guy went viral. He is not the first to attempt these things. He is not the pioneer, right? He's made no necessarily original breakthroughs, right? He's combining existing 
technology, existing perspectives in the pursuit, just like the Chinese emperor of old, to not die. And and uh, well, here, he's here, only in here. he's only his forties, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and he's attempting these things. How dare you? Uh, he doesn't identify as forty anymore. <laughs> what I mean is, his body is biologically. It's been around the sun roughly 45, 40 whatever times. <laughs> okay, so, yeah. so like, it's really interesting. I think to me personally to see somebody around that age range because I'm not that far from him, right? In age and my revel- my. What do we call it? My Revolution. trips around the sun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you're uh, like uh, mid sixties. Yeah, but exactly. But I feel twenty eight. Uh, but <laughs> but it's like it's really cool to see somebody that young with this much money, uh, seeming to really, tr- really try, like do everything he possibly can to f- to answer those riddles that we posed. Right. He cl- he claims it's all based on data. Like, he, he does have some, the way he puts it is interesting. He says like he had a period where he was very unhappy. He was depressed. He says he was overweight um, and he just wanted to eat garbage food because it made him feel good. But then he said he had to like fire nighttime him or that's the way he put it because like this version of him was like asking for all the wrong stuff was acting totally counter to what it would take to be the best version you know physiologically which you know and you could argue that psychologically could follow after that uh, of himself and he just said everything i do now is dictated by best practices around these types of of intake this sure of of stuff sure it sounds like fun there are a lot nah, of people. It doesn't really there are a lot of people who would honestly like to live that way. To uh, like, if you've ever seen, if you've ever seen pilots preparing to take to take a plane into the air, then they're not vibing. They're not freestyling. They have mm-hmm. a list of procedures, right? Check throughs, processes. That's exactly right. That's how and he that's, puts it. Mm-hmm. Do you want to live your life? that way doing your rundown uh every you know cyclical 24 hours here's why he got in the news he got in the news because of a tri-generational blood swapping regimen it's not all the blood it's not all the blood it's some of the blood platelets plasma he's got a uh he, he's got a kid who when this went viral is uh 17 years old he's got a dad uh you know Luckily for him, luckily for anybody with surviving parents, his father is alive. His father, Richard, is 70 years old, and Brian's son, Talmadge, is 17. So the way it works is that Talmadge will give his dad some plasma, some platelets, all the good stuff, and then Brian will take that, digest it through, you know, his plumbing, and he will in turn give some of that not quite new but new to me blood to his father uh and pay it forward you know yeah Yeah. and and, uh two of the three report that they feel better see that once again though i'm not not trying to poo poo anything but like feel better it's it's a very um subjective kind of concept and and there's a lot of placebo effect we know how powerful that can be when you're doing a procedure that seems so like, whoa, this is a techie as, as hell. You know, this seems like it should definitely do something if I'm going through all this this trouble. Um, mm-hmm. Another thing that I think made him go viral was that he took an alarming number of scans of his bowels. It was like yeah. thousands. He, he said he mm-hmm. swallowed a camera the size of a baby carrot, he said, and he took an insane number of scans. And, he, and he's backed up by like a crew of, of scientists who, again, in this Pierce Morgan interview, one of them came on after the mean British scientist, you know, poo-pooed the whole thing. And he's like, you're not wrong, mean British scientist. Um, there are a lot of, of aspects of this that are being, A, misreported. Also, our subject isn't a scientist, and he is sort of a forward-facing guy talking to the media about this and he's getting some things wrong. I thought it was pretty bold. This guy said all that stuff. And um, we are going to start releasing data in peer reviewed journals. And only at that point can the conversation really start to include everybody. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this, this idea, which we covered in a previous episode, modern vampires, longer life through younger blood. It's grisly, but again, it's not wholly new for decades and, Honestly, low-key for centuries, human beings have tried to understand how plasma transfers from young instances of a life form to older instances of a life form may 
mitigate or reverse biological aging. The fancy name for it is parobiosis. That's what happens in Mad Max Fury Road, right? When one of the war boys wants to drive, he's already dying of cancer. And he's like, mm, strap on this. Uh, they call him a blood bag, right? A mm-hmm. blood boy. A blood uh, so, boy. Yeah. So. But, okay. Can I just say, we also yeah. do see in that film that the main guy, you know, uh, Immortan Joe, who holds all the power, is actually not youthful at all. He's like an atrophying, you know, skeleton kind of like decaying before everyone's very eyes. But he wears this like fake suit that makes him look like he's tough. So I think even in that world, you're supposed to kind of realize that this is all bogus. Yeah, but that's the thing. There may be some sand to it. Uh, Harvard recently conducted a study with mice and they used a specific form of parabiosis called heterochronic parabiosis, which means they, they hooked up, not quite human centipede style. They hooked up an old mouse and a young mouse. They did this several times and there's, you know, no God to stop them. They kept these (laughs) circulatory systems plugged up together, running concurrently for three months. And what they found was that the old mice, by virtue of having this new addition to their circulatory system, they lived an average of 6% to 9% longer than the old mice who did not undergo this parabiosis. Worth it. (laughs) <laughs> Where, I mean, you want yeah. that six to nine percent? That it. last nine percent, man. That's that's the good percent. That's what you want. I'm but texting you, Henry Kissinger. You're saying so they essentially it's like you're doing a transfusion, except you're connected to a real living creature, and then something right. else is connected to that. So your blood is flowing from one to the other to the other, and then back around in a, like a loop. That's that's oh wow, that's disturbing but fa- fascinating. I don't think it works for anybody who's about to write the email. I don't for people. Think, yeah, I don't think you can just like wire a utility belt of young mice around you and snake them into your circulatory system. Well, I the think scale, it'll, yeah, of yeah, the system probably has something to do with it. Like we probably couldn't do that with people because it's we can our system. We can do it. Well, not ethically. That but is I'm such saying, a horrible vision. <laughs> oh, dude, it's terrifying, man. But like, I guess what I'm getting at though is like. Maybe it, when you shrink it down, it doesn't matter. But like, it seems like our the the length, the scope of our circulatory systems would make that more difficult, and the pressure would be more of a concern. Like the blood pressure it seems like a lot could go wrong in a human trial of something like this. Well, it's also inconvenient. You know, I like to think of us as running and gunning, sticking and moving. We don't have time sticking for, and poking. Yeah, we don't have bobbing time. and weaving. Yeah. yeah, we don't have time to carry a a Jan Sport equivalent of a human being on our back you know and it, oh matt's in all right matt you i'm thinking got about it, it. I'm, just, I'm thinking about it <laughs> he's thinking about it so we want to give uh credit words to harvard medical school professor of medicine vadim gladyshev uh talks in depth about how they rate success in this experiment and others like it. how do you rate parabiosis how do you know if that old mouse really is getting its second wind Uh, and he goes into depth about some of the variables uh, talks a great deal about what they call the epigenetic clock. We're bringing this up because it's important to note there is a metric here, a metric in play in actual science. And our buddy, Brian, his program never wholly rested on parabiosis. That is one part. It's like the most clickbaity part of this strict regimen of exercise and supplements that he's been doing for a while, which you mentioned earlier, Noel. And at this point, the medical community at large does not recognize this. It does not support any procedure referred to as anti-aging blood transfusion. Exactly. Well, and there are other things that he does too that are not recognized. Uh, ben, like the, some certain infrared light treatments that he goes through, mm-hmm. and a bunch of other things that are they sound really great. And then you can go, you can find websites all over the internet that say, "Hey, this procedure is going to stop this X, Y, and Z in your biological makeup and all this stuff." But there's absolutely no uh, what confirmed or agreed That's upon the That's the thing. actual outcome for these treatments. It's possible that there's something there that we just don't understand yet because this one research study 
appears to show that there's a slight increase in whatever, but, mm-hmm. uh, well, it, it doesn't, it also have to do with the size of a trial. Like that, that's why this Brian Johnson stuff is a little dubious because it's just him. And like, you know, again, the ah. Keith Richards argument, like an individual has a sure. lot of variables as to what make you could smoke 10 packs a day and shoot up junk between your toes and then still somehow manage to live, you know, out into the ripe old age of like 90 something. So we know some individuals do have like super G's case in point, Henrietta Lacks. I mean, that that was a discovery, but like everyone doesn't have that, you know, mm-hmm. and also it's interesting. They mentioned that because recently, earlier this month, as we record in October of 2023, a 23-year-old guy named Andrew Boyd went public with the 75 days he had spent following Brian Johnson's blueprint diet. And at the end of the day, because, you know, let's put the boffins and the nerds outside while we cool people talk about this. (laughs) At the end of the day, this guy said that he had great results he lost 30 pounds. He well, uh, sure. He believed that he, he's like, now my biological age is 19.2. That's the part that's like all yeah. woo woo. Oh, I and, feel, and, I feel yeah. different. Sure. Oh my man. gosh. Yeah. Look, I, I've been doing my very best to, and you know, I use an app. It's like a fitness tracker and calorie intake app. And I, I think I'm probably okay at my weight and age to do about 2,500 calories a day. And I'm trying to do 2000 calories a day. And a big part of his whole regime is, a caloric deficit and anybody that even attempts to do this is going to see some benefit and if you exercise every day even only for 15 minutes you're going to see some benefit from that too i think the issue with this guy is he's just going so hard in the paint and like claiming that it's just he's found the fountain of youth but really the stuff that's working is the basic stuff that anyone can afford or do yeah yeah and here's the thing this technology is on the way How will it scale? How will it roll out? What will the measurable benefits be? Unknown. But modern vampirism is going to be a thing. The stakes are simply too high. (laughs) No apologies. Uh, It's, it's, uh, yeah, it appears that within your lifetime, folks, as you listen tonight, vampires are going to be real. And we didn't have that on the bingo card, but you know, YOLO. Or do YOLO, (laughs) do you only live once? That takes us to the other strange field of research, organ transplants. Oh, so sketchy. I thought you were going to say reincarnation. I was like, yay. (laughs) But but, but like the Bible is full of stories that are like pre-vampire. Like Methuselah is kind of almost like a pre-vampire story. And the fact that like vampire stories have existed in culture and in storytelling for so long shows that it's it's a point of fascination and that it's something that people have been thinking about for a really long time. Mm -hmm. And the idea of blood of the virgin all of that kind of stuff. It doesn't stop. One of the videos that I think I sent you guys was talking about some history of this kind of thing. And like, I think Cleopatra bathed in spoiled donkey's milk. That sounds Mm -hmm. gross. But somebody, you know, said that it was a good idea. And so she was like, sure, YOLO, (laughs) let's do it. Well, it would have been fresh, but it's really tough to get that much donkey milk. So I think the whole transportation and everything. Little fellas. You guys need donkey milk? (laughs) Yeah. You want some? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Let's, we'll finish the show. Let's take it a step further. Ground up donkey teeth. Oh. Sorry, that was a. You like ground up or, I mean, because you can grind them up at home. I can get you a guy, but it's going to be more expensive if they grind it for you. Well, yeah, I've got a mortar and pestle. I'm good. Okay, cool, cool. I've got a ninja, you know. We're keeping this all in. So (laughs) organ transplants are necessary right? Especially if you need one to live. Uh, But they're also tremendously controversial. Check out our earlier episodes on things like the red market. It has been a bloody uncertain endeavor for a long, long time. This may not be the case for much longer. In the near future, you, yes, you, fellow conspiracy realist, may be able to replace any number of physical components so long as you can pay that butcher's bill. And I don't just mean pay in terms of finance. I mean, so long as you can square yourself ethically with what might be going down. Uh, It's like, you know, uh, the official waiting list for organ transplants, terrible, incredibly long. Every single year in the U.S. alone, a minimum of 17 people die on the list. They're not bad people. 
You know what I mean? They didn't do evil stuff. They probably lived a pretty healthy life, but they will die in line for that heart, that kidney, that pancreas, you name it. And this lack of supply, this growing demand creates this underground organ trade network, a pay to play system. You can skip the line. Just like if you pay extra at Disney World, you get a new lease on life as long as you don't ask too many questions. You know what I mean? Like, is this a Uyghur heart? Never ask. Oh, geez. Yeah. And you never know, like in terms of all the qualifications that it takes to even get on that list, like you can't have been a smoker, you can't have had this, this, that and the other. But maybe some of the people with all that money and pull smoked 50 Cohibas a day and they still get that lung transplant, you know, or that's a Cohiba. It's a cigar. It's a fancy cigar. Yeah. So So. this, I I got you. And that's a way to illustrate it. Right. So the, the issue is very real. Uh, This may be changing because quite recently, some scientists over at Harvard made a stunning announcement. They had transplanted a kidney from a pig into a monkey And despite the vast genetic differences, that monkey lived for two years after that. If you think about it, in the world of folklore and myth, they made a chimera. And and sure, that sounds a little pretentious. We get it. We're nerds. But uh, (laughs) if you think that's pretentious, just wait for the official term of this science, which is even weirder. The name is xenotransplantation. Xenomorph? (laughs) Xeno transplantation. Wow. I know. Yeah. What sort of math rock album is that from? Yeah. HR it's Giger cool. did their, did their like pitch deck. Um, I have a quick question though, Ben, you said two years, you know, obviously animals have a shorter lifespan in general. Um, but I think, uh, apes have a similar lifespan to humans. So what broke down after two years, two years seems like a minor win, but not a major win. Oh, it's very much a major win. Okay. Because, you know, yeah. But yeah. And the only reason it worked. Yeah. It's not, it's like, You know, when the Wright brothers flew the first mechanically powered aircraft, they didn't get to Tokyo in one go. You know what I mean? So this is like a first flight, a proof of concept. And that monkey, by the way, uh, the only reason it lived for as long as it did is because this was not an ordinary pig. This pig was grown specifically to be sacrificed. And a company named eGenesis leveraged the incredibly dangerous and fascinating technology CRISPR. Uh, E-Genesis altered this pig's genome uh, at least 69 times. And again, to our earlier con- uh, our earlier comparison about, you know, a bank of light switches and you don't know what else they're affecting in the house, we don't know. Two years is actually really good. It's really impressive, uh, especially when you consider that A little bit before this, two separate research institutions took brain-dead humans and they put uh, genetically modified pig kidneys into those bodies. Just, you know, uh, beat me here, Paul, just to f*** around and find out, right? Yeah, well, because they just wanted to see if the kidney would take, right? That was the whole point. Oh, yeah, Yeah. exactly. For the Um, love of the game. You yeah. Know? yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but there's there's other stuff going on too that's been highlighted in a couple of places, and I just want to shout this person out because I think there's something here, you guys. Uh, it's Dr. Doris Taylor, and she works at Regen- Regenerative Medicine Research. That's the name of it. It's in I think Houston, Texas, where she's working. But they're creating lab grown human organs. So what they do, uh, Ben, is they'll take a pig heart. And remove all the blood, all of the cells that make that a pig heart. And what you end up having is this translucently white looking thing that is a heart. Then you will put it in a bath basically of human cells, like cultured human cells. Then those human cells develop, they develop around the heart. They're they're stem cells, right? So they create, Mm -hmm. they match their environment or they're very good at that. I'm so so glad you're mentioning this. Yes. Like, that that to me is incredible because it matches up with what we're talking about it's here. Like, if we can really hone this science, we could potentially just create Ben's new heart if we wanted to with a couple of Ben's cultures, right? If we if we had a, a 
a pig heart or something that could go along with it or Matt's new liver. Like that would be amazing. I don't know. I think, I think that's, that's at least one of the stepping stones toward what we're, what we're trying to get towards. Just so. Yes, for, for sure. But also speaking about like the storytelling aspect of this and vampirism, there's also Frankenstein and Frankenstein's monster and the idea of going against God and how inevitably uh, nothing but bad things will come of that. And I'm not saying I believe that, but I think there are those that do. And we know that unchecked this kind of stuff, especially when it's all in the service of, of, of money it can be very scary. It can really go into dangerous uh, territories. I'm glad you mentioned checks and balances. To be absolutely clear, the only real check, the only real balance on this is going to be the... Um, the one the doctor takes home. Sorry. Well, the, right, the current <laughs> system. The, the it's pay not to called play practicing system. medicine for nothing. <laughs> the pay-to-play system of late-stage capitalism, right? And a distant second check... The only other real one is uh, humankind's level of self-regard for what it sees as ethics. Ethics. If those exactly. if those two things did not exist, then you could have your pig heart, your pig liver, right now. You know what I mean? Uh, but but of course, uh, there is a legacy. Uh, there there are several legacy systems in play. Which are kind of, I don't want to say Lagging. stymieing the research, <laughs> but they're making it, you know, they're making what could have been a two hour movie, a summer long TV show. But, but no, la I say lagging because these legacy, you know, checks and balances, as we always say, the technology always far exceeds some of these legacy, you know, oversights that are in place. So, and when you're a company that has the pull, you know, whether it be with lobbies or whatever it might be, there are ways around this stuff. We know that that happens. Also, the people in power in this iteration of the, of human civilization tend to be pretty old. So they are therefore incentivized. You yeah. know what I mean? Like yeah. uh, Mitch McConnell's probably saying, mm, once I get that new ticker, it's going to be a whole new Mitch, baby. Uh, so the uh, wouldn't that be funny if Mitch just showed up one day and was like the Fonz, just like like just totally like leather jacket, just like, smacks hey, a jukebox. It's me. That is it's for some reason Mitch. in Congress. <laughs> yeah, uh, humanity's not there yet. There is a world in which you could have a pig grown specifically a bespoke donor for you and all you have to do to get these custom-made organs is to somehow be able to pay for it ben it also reminds me of like it's something that i guess hasn't been reported as much about lately because maybe it's old hat but like those rats or mice that they could grow a human ear on you know sure. like stuff yeah. like that mm -hmm. where it's very single use single purpose you know and like these types of pigs you're talking about you'd obviously have to you know um contribute some of your genetic material and then here's the guy that's gonna grow the thing that's gonna be just for you the primary barrier to this research is not ethics. The primary barrier is late stage capitalism. Money is a religion and it's not the root of all evil, but you know, it's unnecessarily complicating progress is what I, I'm thinking. I mean, there, there's this idea, right? Uh, that you could, all things being equal, if this research continues, one could have a new organ as like a pay to play real and really expensive option. You know, imagine a world in which anyone with enough financial liquidity can start treating their body like a vehicle. I'm keeping the car analogy, you know, hundred percent. instead of a harrowing life or death, get right with God moment when you need a new liver, it becomes something like changing your oil. No, oh, I got to go replace the brake pads. Uh, with my nephrologist, I need a new kidney. I wore the we other also, one out. Oh, I thought that was going to be your knees or something. <laughs> but, but we also know plenty of people that can maybe afford to change the oil in their car, but then if the brakes go bad, they're like, screwed. I can't afford a brake job, or I can't afford a new transmission, or whatever it might be. And um, that cyberpunk game I was talking about earlier, there's a thing in it where like there are these you know, medical vehicles that swoop in anytime someone gets hurt, but only if they are rich enough to be in the system to be taken care of. 
Like there, there's a scene, there's actually a really good anime uh, cyberpunk thing where uh, this kid and his mom get into a bad car accident and the med uh, team comes and they scan them like, nope, he doesn't have the bright plan. And they just leave them to die. You know, I mean, that to your point about capitalism, that is what that yields is the haves and have nots, the tiered service of it all. Yeah. Yeah. And th- there's the issue here as well. None of these solutions fix the third problem durable cognition. That is the key. Over time, without intervention, the human brain will inevitably degrade because it is, it's just more meat. It's organic. The mind succumbs to dementia, Alzheimer's, all the cool hits, all the slow jazz, and everything that makes you the you is lost. And that ship of thesis might behave like a brand new body, But what's the use if there's no one at the wheel? How do we solve this third problem? We'll tell you after a word from our sponsors. Okay, side note, we promised it in the beginning and we know we're going long here. Our original off-air conversation about organ transplants that inspired us to pursue this update, we were surprised to discover multiple cases of something spooky. It turns out there's a non-zero amount of people who receive organ transplants and then become certain they have additionally received a piece of the donor's personality, preferences, phobias, habits, software of the soul. That's the playing God part. <laughs> That's the part that where it all goes, you know, you can't, I mean, hell man, it happens with computers. You, you do an update and all of a sudden some of your stuff doesn't work because it, it, it hasn't been updated to match the update for the operating system. I mean, I think it's a, a relatively reasonable um, analog, but with humans, it's like, we don't really know. They don't even know someone has Alzheimer's unequivocally until they do an autopsy on the brain after. The right. Brain. Yeah. Good point. This, this idea that human beings could be, to some degree, uh, emulating the planarian, the flatworm, this leads us to something called cellular memory theory. The idea that, quote, behaviors and emotions acquired by the recipient from the original donor are due to combinatorial memories stored in the neurons of the organ donated. Very Stephen King sounding, right? Dude. So, okay, this is one example. Uh, It's pretty gruesome. Uh, This is what we were talking about off air. Wanted to share it with you fellow listeners. Back in 1996, this guy in Vidalia, Georgia, his name's Sonny Graham. He gets a heart transplant. Amazing. Saves his life. He gets this heart from a guy he's never met named Terry Cottle. Terry Cottle commits suicide when he's only 33 years old, which for a lot of us in our 20s, we get that saying only 33 sounds like a well-lived life. It is not. It's a very short life. Uh, He took his life with a firearm. Sonny Graham gets the heart. Sonny Graham is over the moon, right? He's alive. He didn't expect to be. And so he does what I think we could agree is the right thing. He begins a correspondence with Cottle's family. You know, Cottle was a father, a husband, etc. He had his own life. So this guy, Sonny, is writing to the Cottle family. And in January of 1997, he meets the widow of the guy who saved his life. She's a lady named Cheryl Cottle. She's 28 years old at the time. She lives in Charleston. And they strike up a romance. Yeah, trauma bonding. (laughs) I mean, that's... Perhaps. Okay, who am I to to say? You know, but it's interesting. Where the story goes is beyond fascinating but it also there are other aspects of it that could make it not what the spooky thing is but the spooky thing is it feels front center i have to say yeah he marries coddle's widow and then several years later on april 1st 2008 sonny graham takes his own life with a firearm and it's my understanding that people that knew him said he never exhibited any signs of depression or or mental illness 
None whatsoever, apparently. But th- this sounds like a macabre campfire story. Uh, and it, it happened on April Fool's Day. And it happened Come on April on. Fool's Day. Wait, wait surely we, we know that this is true, though. I mean, this is true. That, okay. is, when, okay. that is when he took his own life. Uh, and therefore, arguably, the life of uh, or some remnant of the life of Terry Cottle. The the thing is that there it sounds spooky. It's a macabre campfire story. Ha ha. We're all scared. October, whatever. But several studies indicate there may be some sort of let's call it persistence of the mind within the donated organs. But are we talking about the soul? Are we talking about remnants of the soul in a piece of meat that is then reconstituted and connected to somebody else's system? Like the fact Somewhat. that people say my heart, I love you with my, all my heart. Like, I think that's irrelevant. It could just as likely be in your liver, but the heart, man, that's the central clock of your entire existence. You know? There's a journal called Quality of Life Research, and in this, uh, you can read a study where researchers interviewed 47 different patients, each of whom received a heart transplant over a window of two years in Vienna. They found that 79% of the folks they interviewed didn't feel their personality had changed. 15% felt that they had some sort of change, and they just thought it was because it was a milestone. They almost died. Right. Of course, like someone with a near death experience, you're going to be different. Six percent, though, did confirm they had a drastic change in their personality. And they said due entirely to this piece of a different person existing inside them. I mean, caveat emptor, let the buyer beware. You might get more than a new hunk of meat. You know, if some of these scientists are correct, you might be carrying like a plenarian a tiny bit of someone else's source code with you. Which brings us to, of course, we're talking source code, digital immortality. This is the one that's going to happen. This is the one that's going to, like, this is the one that's going to happen and be stuff they don't want you to know until a huge watershed moment. Yeah, there there was actually a Duncan Jones film called Source Code. Uh, David Bowie's son, who, he directed the Warcraft movie, but that's not. He, his moon he did with um, Sam Brockwell and then Source Code with Jake Gyllenhaal, and it's all about this kind of stuff. But also there's an episode of Black Mirror where a, a woman tragically loses her husband in an accident, and then there's this thing where you can get this, like, stand-in surrogate version that you have to grow in the bathtub, and then you upload all of their Facebook and social media, and it becomes – a passable version of the person, but of course the, the, the twist, not really the twist, but is that it's not the person. It's, it's a facsimile of the person. Yeah. Yeah. A good emulation. What is it? Simaculorum? Uh, smac- Simulacrum. Simulacrum. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. I still have a rudimentary grasp on English at best. No. Uh, digital immortality. It's the idea that you can, It's like music, okay? So what is a song? Is a song the guitar upon which the song is played, or is the song the pattern, the series of notes, you know? Uh, The idea of digital immortality hinges upon the concept of people, the you that you mean when you say you, uh, existing as patterns, as software songs. The idea being that if we gather enough information about a single instance of an individual and funnel that into some large language, near generalized AI model, that the resulting code can respond and react to stimuli in a manner increasingly close to what the responses would have been if that person was still alive. It's heady stuff. It's no longer impossible. It is happening right now and it's really scary it's traumatic i imagine like um you know everybody's lost somebody think about it if you're able to speak with some emulation of your lost spouse child parent close friend and then you realize at some point in that turing test that you are just encountering a remix of things they said i mean honestly it's like you know i mean would uh, it make you feel more or less lonely is the more question. More, I think. I think it's, you know, I, I, my mother passed a year or so ago, a little more, and I'm very reticent to listen to old voicemails from her. It, it, it's like, it really hits you in a place. Like, I don't know that I would want this, especially knowing maybe like for 
somebody who who isn't as you know embedded in this kind of stuff as we are maybe they would but to me it just seems dangerous especially if it could talk back you know i just you could get addicted to that and that, that, that's what the it's called be right back the black mirror episode starring dom hall gleason is about it is literally what we're talking about here yeah i i, I don't know i can imagine a, a good version of it like um uh... Imagining just FaceTiming with somebody you care about that you've lost, but getting to feel that, like, you know, just share your day with somebody that you really care about and you care about them caring about you, even if they're not there anymore. I think that could be a positive thing, but I do think you're right. It would be addicting and it wouldn't help you. It wouldn't be beneficial to you with other you relationships it in your help you get past life, it. right? Yeah. But what no. if it's ad supported? I was holding that one back for oh, you guys. Shit. You know what I mean? Like, well, that's a different Black Mirror uh, I episode. love you too. <laughs> I wish I could have I wish I could have told you this while I was in the hospital coding out. Well, I wish yeah, we could have played Royal has a sale right now. <laughs> we could have played Royal Match together, you know? That would, would mm -hmm. but, play but, Royal Match yeah. with your deceased loved ones. All right, know? I tricked you guys a little bit. That is oh, kind yeah. of an evil thing. It is possible because we are in the early days. This field of research, this idea um What's most interesting about it is that if it goes well, then this mind would not experience the same organic degradation of a meatball mind. Uh, if it does experience some metaphysical version of a malfunction, you can just reboot it. <laughs> like you know, the jellyfish. St right? Start the soul <laughs> over at the version of last saved game. A digital answer, yes, to the Turtopsis. And this research has been galvanized by breakthroughs in LLMs, large language modeling, aka street name chat GPT, uh, rise of deep fakes, increasingly generalized AI models. Something like this is going to happen. We are not too far out from what I would I would like I would propose we call it the emulated human, the EH. Well, dude, you can use Chat GPT to have a conversation with William Shakespeare. What's to prevent you from using Chat GPT to have a conversation with your deceased grandmother? Mm -hmm. Especially considering how much more data there is about people who died recently. Right? That's true. And obviously there's way more data about William Shakespeare and people writing about him and every every number of thing. But if you there could be a bespoke service where you upload all this stuff to the cloud and then it gives you this like version that Let, we're there. You're right, Ben. We're totally we're there. Well, well, let's talk about the emulated human. You know, I'm very into this idea. It might be my new beat later, but Something that would appear to have the opinions, the imaginations, the fears, the aspirations of that person you knew. Humanity is not prepared for this. What happens when an emulated human gets close enough in terms of fidelity to genuinely pass a Turing test and function as an undead version of that person you loved? Are they going to be able to represent themselves in court? Can they vote? Right. Can they make Power a will? Power of attorney. Yeah. You know, first question Uncle Sam has, are they going to pay taxes? You know, the, the other question, what would it be able to demand its own destruction? Right? Like but that, all of these, yeah. I would I would think all of these things would be laid out in advance. It's like intellectual property at this point. It's not, you know what I mean? Like there's different rules about stuff like this, but I don't mm. think that those rules exist yet. I don't they think don't. there's any uh, document that has a clause that would address any of this stuff. Check all. out Westworld. Uh, yeah. Every season, there's really interesting uh, like thoughts about this mm -hmm. in each season, like IP and individuality and mm -hmm. all, all of these things. It's really, really good. And so we we know we're we're running long. Apologies, mission control. We have to ask what happens when an emulated human mind decides it would like a body, right? Because again, the technology is there. It just hasn't been combined into the correct applicable gestalt. You know what I mean? Like you can 3D print, right? Lab grown can, meat is on the way. It's just too expensive right now. You just you just hit command Q. You just quit. You just, I don't want to hear this anymore. Uh, there's nothing making you have to answer their demands. They're a puppet show for you, right? Like, I'm not meaning to be callous. I just mean at a certain point, it's like if, if all of this stuff, all things being equal, like this is a presentation for your benefit that you're paying for. It is a dance that you are enjoying slash benefiting from. 
we are not at this point ascribing any agency to these representations. And that's a whole nother conversation, you know? Right. That's what I'm saying. Do oh, they yeah, have exactly. agency, right? Like, but when okay. do they get it? Who gives it, them that? The innovation, law? innovation is Usain Bolt. Legislation is a three-year-old learning to walk while they're carrying a backpack of bricks. You know what right. I mean? The race right. is pretty predictable. Uh, we do want to make a moment before we close to talk about other life extension products, procedures, tactics, and snake oil, because there is a panoply of these. Many of them are roundly dismissed as little more than the placebo effect, or at the more sinister side of the spectrum, they can be scams and cons taking advantage of people laboring under the weight of fear. I mean, things like med beds, Matt, you earlier mentioned light treatments. A, a, a lot of these things do provide a benefit, or at the very least, they don't actually harm people. Sure. The, they fall apart when they tend to make extravagant claims. Well, even the stuff Brian Johnson's talking about, just like, you know, extreme adherence to these regimes and like, you know, um, supplements and such. None of the stuff that he's talking about is bad for you. If you did it, you probably would benefit. But the idea of like ascribing some sort of like this is the new way to eternal life is in and of itself kind of a little problematic. No, you shared a video with us earlier today. Uh, it's by McConaughey. Mo yeah, McConaughey. Exactly. And um, it's this reporter, Marin Hunsberger, who is just kind of exploring this concept. Right. And she ends up going to this place called the Rad Festival that I had never heard of. It's in Las Vegas, Nevada, and it's they call it the Woodstock of Radical Life Extension Technologies. Okay. Right? So there, she explores all kinds of different products and companies that are offering services, basically, or again, a device you could have at your own house that purport to do things that we've been talking about in this episode. Extending your life or the quality of your life or letting you, you know live a little bit longer, a little bit healthier. And I just think it was worth us mentioning, we don't have to talk about any of them specifically, but just that to my eyes and ears, those technologies and companies seem to be aimed directly at older consumers who are concerned with their own mortality, who happen to either be wealthy enough to drop a couple thousand dollars on something or have enough retirement money or income, right, to not be worried about dropping a couple thousand dollars on something. You think it's an accident that it was in Las Vegas? I mean, like we talked about how like casinos also target older people with like disposable incomes. And again, some of the things in here, you know, results may vary, I guess, but some of them in the marketing behind them, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. But in the same time in that documentary, you can learn really interesting things about stuff that we already mentioned this, in this episode, but research into how to extend life's good years and then shorten the amount of deterioration years, right? And just, we just at least should mention this. You can look it up uh, on your own time, but Dr. Leonard Guarante from MIT studying these things called SIR2 genes, which is, it's this incredible way to basically stop genes from hitting that genetic kill switch or the, the off switch to where cells will stop regenerating and stop reproducing. Uh, it's fascinating stuff. And hopefully there's some kind of silver lining in here somewhere that says all of this isn't apocalyptic. All of it isn't just for, you know, ultra wealthy people. We could, as a species, maybe get to a place that isn't immortality, but is, but is at least uh, improving the good stuff and decreasing the bad stuff. Whoa. And it becomes prisoner's dilemma. It really does. Like, if you could, if you could guarantee that every single instance of a Homo sapiens would have a very well-lived quality of life up until maybe 50 years old everybody dies when they're 50 or something like that, uh, then how many people of the billions out there would be willing to sacrifice what they see as their extra 27 years, right? Uh, in, in return for making the better, the world a better place for everyone. Well, and one thing I think was in this video, it might've been in another one. Um, the argument 
in these types of discussions always comes up about like how well the world is already like we're, we're running out of resources, populations ballooning out of control. What would it mean if all of a sudden everybody lived forever? It would be a drain on resources. It would be a drain on a lot of things, especially if people were retired and just living forever, you know, and like had to be taken care of in some way, shape or form. But uh, and I wish I could remember because I thought this guy made a really good point. He said, if you knew that the problems of the future were going to be your problems, wouldn't you live life a little differently? Sure. Right. Would a president in a democracy be more responsible if uh, something after the four year uh, period of POTUS <laughs> mattered or affected them? Oh. Yeah. Well, if they were going to live longer than a couple years mean. after no, that's their what last I mean. Term. Literally, your life. Like, if you were going to live longer and you were going to experience the results of climate change or whatever it might be, would you feel differently? Would you behave differently? And, you know, the argument is like, well, I'm doing it for my kids, for my grandkids. But that's not the same as doing it for you. And I'm not saying that people are inherently selfish, but I do think it would it would move the needle in an interesting way. That's all. No, that's, yeah. Speaking of interesting, it's interesting that you talk about humanity's inherent selfishness. Because if you really interrogate that as a human being, what you will find is that ultimately your selfish interest in the long term, they align with all that crazy utopian stuff. It is better for you as an individual to live in a world that is sustainable. It is better for you as an individual to live in a world where people aren't committing crime out of necessity. The logic is solid and it's sad that it is so difficult and put upon the consumer to eliminate the noise. Let's, I, I love that we're going to questions because that's where we end. Let's end on the most important point. With all the factors we talked about at play, it is now increasingly possible that someone alive today will achieve a form of immortality. Personally, I think it's going to happen. They might live to a thousand. They might have some, they might be the emulated human may live forever or until the servers get unplugged. But one thing for sure, it's not going to be perfect. It is going to upend civilization. I think this is a huge point because as we established earlier for years, all successful human civilizations fundamentally depend on people dying on a routine basis. The world is not ready. The research will increase, but it's the cusp of a strange renaissance, a future feedback loop. Our feet are halfway off the chasm of this Grand Canyon. I mean, we have to end with those questions. How will this technology roll out? How will civilization adjust to a class of millenarians and immortals, especially and these people who don't die still need to do the human things like eat, sleep, drink potable water. How would you solve the problem of immortality, fellow conspiracy realist? Uh, I, I asking, honestly don't think it's that dire or or, or bad. I, I think so. I yet. think I th- I think it's going to be great actually mm-hmm. uh, because I d- I don't I don't have that I don't know man I feel I kind of am aligning with the once. If people actually were living longer, they would want to improve things more than they currently do. That That's really where I see it. So let us know your thoughts, Conspiracy Realist. Uh, we appreciate your time as always. We endeavor to be easy to find online. Correct. You can find us at the handle Conspiracy Stuff on uh, X, uh, nay, Twitter, wait, X, uh, FKA Twitter, whatever. Um, YouTube and Facebook, Conspiracy Stuff Show on Instagram and TikTok. Hey, we've got a phone number. It's 1-833-STDWYTK. You've got three minutes when you call in, give yourself a cool name, and let us know if we can use your name and message on the air. If you don't want to do that, why not send us a good old-fashioned email? We are conspiracy at iheartradio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.